Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the Delta Green tabletop role-playing game rules by Art Dream Publishing. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. Listeners should know that this podcast will include mature themes and scenes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, military organizations, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living, dead, or redacted, is completely coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your handler. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am back as your handler, Michael Diamond, and we are back with another portion of our home series for the Delta Green portion of our show. And I have a agent with me this evening. Agent, please introduce yourself. Hi, this is Nate, uh, your friend Nate on the Discord, and I'm playing Special Agent Elliot Winters. I am sort of between assignments at the moment. You are. Um, you are between assignments. The interesting thing is, given the way the last assignment worked, I have the feeling that Elliot's going to be on the move. Give us um, a broad brushstroke of what you think Elliot would do directly after the We'll just say the instant underground. Absolutely. I think Elliot would have taken leave of New York City. Things are way too hot in the city. And maybe stopping at a rest stop or a gas station, something. Denny's pulled out his little field notebook. It's battered. 20 years he's been writing little notes here and there and would have paged through. And he's paging back before this investigation, the missing children before the McAllister building. He's looking at that first sort of introduction to this strangeness. And I'm thinking about that kid who died in my arms after a drug overdose. A kid that I had tried to drag out and save from that situation. One of Elliot's motivations has been since day one, uh, the war on drugs, sort of the the good and the bad, mostly bad idea of the war on drugs. He's a government agent, DEA, and did special assignments and was well steeped and just immersed in the Reagan era war on drugs. And looking at that, I have some unfinished business there. And the unfinished business was Jojo died and I promised him that I would let his family know to some degree what had happened. And I think that's that's what I'm going to do. I need to get away anyway, and that'll occupy me for a little bit of time. Fortunately for you, the opportunity to search really in the criminal database, your access to NCIC is reasonably open enough as a special agent where you can dig into who Jojo was and dig into what he might have been involved in. It leads you in that same search to Highland, New York. So this is a relatively small city, if it can even be called that. Hamlet's probably more apt. It's in Ulster County, New York. It is a couple hours north of the city. Population is maybe three to 5,000. See Hamlet over by Lake Erie? Is that what I'm looking at? You are looking at Highland. This is north, but uh, it's on the Hudson. Got it. Got it. I got it. You see, we're, we're, what year is it again? Well, this is going to be post-1997. So we'll say that given given the last operation was in 1997, you're doing this directly after it. We'll say that this happens in 1997, given that you're you're sort of beelining directly to that to get away from what, what's gone on. There really isn't a ton to speak of when it comes to Highland, given the population itself. But that said, this is a very kind of atypical upstate New York downtown, right? Lots of brick buildings, or especially brick lower siding upper buildings. It's got the sort of quaint, kitschy downtown Main Street vibe before it eventually gets recycled like three cent- three decades later for us. It's quiet. People go to work, people stop at the local bars, all maybe three of them. There's a lot of like baseball fields, 
weekender spots. People have houses in the extended area here to get away from the city. New York City, for sure. But Jojo's family tracks down to a place not terribly far from the main street here. It looks like, at least from the records that you're able to locate, that his father works as a dentist in this town and has for about 30 or so years. What Elliot finds in his investigation of Jojo's family is that the family dentistry is really family-oriented in the sense that Jojo's dad does the dentistry out of his house. Like, he has an attached building, and they do it right there on the property, right? It's got the typical wood sign on the mailbox underneath, right? So you see John Thomas DDS, right? It's a white sign made out of wood, black lettering, super easy to read as you drive up to it. A house is set back, bungalow style from the curb. The lawn is reasonably taken care of, probably by a riding lawnmower. There's a, a three season porch on the front of this place. I've got a couple of chairs there. And then there's a regular front, front of a craftsman's house style front door that sits and's had some woodwork done there. It's very Americana here. This sounds classic. Pretty much so. I think I'd probably pull my rental up and park somewhere near this spot. I'm not in a huge rush. And so I think I'd get out and I'd walk I'd walk the neighborhood a little bit and just just take in what's around me, try and picture, imagine this young man that I saw his life end, try and picture what his life might have been before and maybe you know, say hi to anyone else that I encounter. Uh, and if anyone questions, you know, I have a ready story on hand. So walking the neighborhood, you see that Jojo didn't live probably terribly far from the elementary school and high school, Highland Elementary and Highland High School, which are maybe three blocks away. In between there, there's a like a light commercial apple farm. So there are some fields there, but then there's also the processing plants as well. As you walk the neighborhood a little north, you get close to a, a soccer field, which also has at the back of it, it looks like a place to, it doesn't even look like a traditional baseball diamond. It looks like kids have roughed this in with their tennis shoes on spring and summer. And there's no actual bases, but there are lines of dirt that make the diamond symbol. And it's so fresh and really refreshing. You can imagine the crack of the bat and the kids and the running around that is done in this field. And then beyond that is a more formal soccer ground. It seems like a place anybody might like to grow up. You can imagine the stream of bicycles that go up and down some of these streets. You can imagine 4th of July and the big fields that are nearby with all the fireworks. You're not really sure what drew Jojo to the city, to the, the heat that he eventually caught in a terrible series of events. But he grew up here, probably like a lot of kids did in America in the 80s and just decided that he needed something different at some point. This kid didn't know. He didn't know how good he had it sitting here. And I think a little chill goes down my spine. I'm wondering if this is Sandlot or Stephen King. Because I'm looking at all this homey Americana and classic Main Street America fair. Some of these houses you could see pictured directly in a, in a King novel. Big houses, right? Might have been two, three families at one point, but have been, you know, retrofitted over the years to become big single family homes. Just south of his house, there is an oak tree that has got to be 90, 100 feet tall, massive branches. You can probably, as you walk, even make out some of the attempts at putting a tree house that there have been in it. There's a tire swing on it, of course. It's too good. Everything is right here. Well, I guess it's time to 
ruin these poor folks. I'm going to head back towards the dentist office. Okay. You don't get any sort of side eye from folks who are uh, walking blocks or spending time with their dogs and whatnot. Everybody seems very genial. Nobody, you know, gives you a jaundiced eye by any means. I wouldn't say that they go out of their way to wave, right? It's not um, Ward and June Cleaver's neighborhood, but but yeah, there's um, there's definitely a sense here that it's a place you could settle down, raise a family, that sort of thing. That's all beyond you at this point, but um, for somebody else's life, it's probably a good idea. So walking up to the dentist office, the house in which it is contained in, you see very distinctly as you get closer, there are actually two doors that are sit at the front of the house. One looks like a more standard storm door, all white glass, definitely a little bit more business-like. And then next to it, probably about 10 or so feet down, there is a all glass storm door and then a really like a heavy wooden front door with uh, three distinct vertical rectangular windows at sort of a, a diagonal arc. Very common. There's a doorbell for either one. Well, go towards the professional side, or what I think is the professional side. It's the first one, for sure. And I'll try the door, see if it's open. Oh, absolutely. So I'll push the door open and call out, hello? Yeah, there's a little bell that dings at the top of the door as you walk in. There's a, um, it looks like a converted either closet or small bedroom that's been made into sort of a receptionist area here. There's a older woman behind that desk who's filling out some paperwork and setting some things aside. She has a, a phone with a, sort of that plastic addition to the back of it that will help cradle it against her neck when she has to talk on the phone. She... She is just putting that down as you walk in. Hi, can I help you? I'll walk up. I'll extend a hand. And, yes, ma'am. Uh, my name's Oscar Bennett, and I'm wondering if Dr. Thomas might have a moment to speak to me. Oh, uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, Oscar, you said? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm out of New York City. Oh, oh, sure, sure. Let me, uh, let me grab him. She stands up. She's probably in her mid-40s or so. She stands up and makes her way through a, a door. She opens it, and you can see the... Just for a moment, the, there's a hallway that runs all the way down to the back of the house. She shuts the door. You hear some murmured speech from back beyond there, and then she comes back out a couple minutes later. He'll, uh, he, he'll be right with you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh you, uh, you Mrs. Thomas, or...? Oh, no. No, no, no. She sits down at the chair and sort of adjusts her hair. Mrs. Thomas uh, passed uh, about five years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. You got a bad tooth or something? She begins to, like, pull paperwork from other places. Yeah, sort of, sort of, sort of something like that. Something like, it's a beautiful town, beautiful neighborhood uh, set up in here. Yes, no, it is. Highland's amazing. We get a lot of folks uh, that come up here during the summer. I expect you do. You got rentals and vacation homes, you think? Is it is it like a seasonal town up here? Uh, it can be. There's a, um, there's a couple different um, clubs that are nearby that operate in the, the wetlands and uh, the fishing areas and that sort of thing. Do a little bit of fishing myself. I might need to take a peek at that after this business is done. Yeah, and then we have, you know, the folks who are they're interested here to see the area close to the Hudson and the care clinics that are that are around here. Oh, absolutely. I don't mean to pry, but um, you said Mrs. Thomas passed. Mr. Thomas just in this in this big old house all by himself? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, him and Buckley, the dog. What's his temper? How is he? What's he like? I never met him, obviously. Oh, uh, well, he's a good man. He's uh, quiet. He's easy to talk to. You know, he gets along with his patients, and he can be a little stern sometimes when it comes to the kids. They they play stick ball here on the street sometimes, and the balls end up on top of the roof. And But other than that, he lives a pretty quiet uh, life now after... Being a widowed stickball, Jesus, just like a slice out of history up in here. We used to play stickball 
And if we weren't playing stickball, we were playing kick the can when I was growing up. Hmm. I, I didn't think kids still played them kind of games. Well, there's a few things that Highland doesn't have. There's, there's no arcade here. You know, there's no big shopping centers. There's no mall to run around in, so they still get along every day by trying to figure out regular games. You reckon them kids get bored? Oh, sure. Sometimes that's that that's a recipe for trouble when, when some kids get a little bit older and there ain't nothing to do. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He'd know that way, too. You know, it's... Well, I don't want to speak out of turn, of course, but... <sighs> He does have a son, lives down in New York City. Left here because um, he was bored, didn't want to work with uh, family practice. and yes. So he left all this and decided to see what he could find for himself in the city. Yeah, uh, there was a girl at some point, I understand. And they were getting serious, and last I knew, uh, what... It had been a while ago. I thought they were just looking for a, a new job for him to earn some more money. It sounded like maybe they were gonna get married or something like that. Oh dear. Yeah, that's a tale this old as time. And I'm gonna look around. Are there maybe any photos or any any personal things on the walls or something like that, maybe, to decorate? If you scan the waiting room here, there is a photo that is not it's not behind the receptionist desk but it's more like to your left as you look out a window there's a potted plant nearby and you can see a person you know who is jojo but probably i don't know three or four years younger than you had met him it looks like it was taken in somewhere near the beach there's an enormous marlin and there's dad and his son smiles just beaming bright enough to light up a room about the time you see it, the door opens to the reception room and you see a um, a man probably mid-50s step through the door. He's wearing, um, I guess they're, they're basically scrubs, essentially. But they're colorful. He's got a bunch of dogs all over him, little patterned dogs. Uh, yeah, can I help you? But Mr. Thomas, I'm just admiring this, this fish in this picture here. Oh, <laughs> he steps forward, extends his hand out. Yeah, uh, we caught a whopper for sure. Look at that thing, huh? That's my son there. That's Joe. Hmm. Yeah, do you mind? I'm, I'm sorry. To, I know I'm just barging in, interrupting, but uh, do you mind if we maybe sit and have a just a little a little chat um, somewhere? Maybe I don't want to set you on edge, but maybe somewhere we can have a chat uh, private. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I got to come back to the office here. Thank you, ma'am. Um, appreciate appreciate your kindness. Sure, of course, of course. You uh, walk back down the long hallway, past a couple of patient rooms. He's only got two, and then step into like an eight by ten office. It's not very big. It's got a single desk. There's not a whole lot of clutter here, but the walls are just filled with different memories. You see the aforementioned, or so the afore pictured as well, Marlin which is hanging uh, in sort of as a, a backdrop to one part of the wall here. And you see just different little boxes, pictures, uh, you know, Mr. Thomas here and, and what is likely his wife in a few different pictures. You see Jojo, um, you see a couple of um, what look like sort of industry dinners or events. You see a bunch of things on his desk. The one thing you don't see on his desk is a computer. And so it's devoid of any sort of high technology. There's a phone there if he needs to answer it. But other than that, it's paperwork. There's a patient file open right now. It's got some x-rays in it. And he uh, sort of unclutters a relatively clean desk and extends his hand to a chair. Yeah. Go ahead and take a seat. Take a seat. Is that, is that the same fish? Yeah. 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 Same fish. That is a monster. Hmm. Hmm. It took us forever to pull it into the boat, but um, good memories, good memories. He steps over the a long, long arm, shuts the door. 
Uh, you said you wanted to talk in private. Uh, how can I help you? Yeah. Um, look, I'm I'm real sorry for what I have to share, but I feel like, well, it's my responsibility. It's my duty to do. I'm, I'm not to mince uh, words. I'm 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 here to talk about JoJo. I briefly met your son in New York City once. And Mr. Thomas, I'm terribly, terribly sorry to inform you that he uh, passed away a number of years ago. What? It was a it was a drug overdose. It's taken this long to sort of sort out his identity and, and where you're at and all this business. I, I'm I'm dreadfully terrible. Sorry, sir. Oh, well, we lost contact a while back, and I just figured that he was needing space. Um, I got, oh, I got tied up, and I just, I didn't, I didn't reach back out. I figured he would, I figured he and, and Tina would be okay, and they would call me, and, and, um. It's not, don't, don't put this on you. This, this isn't on you. He got wrapped up with some bad people and they took advantage of his good nature. I I got to know him just a tiny little bit and I could see that he just got wrapped up in things bigger than than he was prepared to deal with. I'm, I'm so sorry. He seemed like a, a, a great kid. He, he is. He was working real hard last I knew. Real hard just trying to make it in that damn city and I told him I said, you can come back here at any time. You don't have to go to dentist school. You don't have to do anything. But that city will chew you up and, and eat you alive. Absolutely right about that, sir. It will and it does. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. What do you have to do with any of this? Why didn't the local police... It's been years. I said, sir, it took... It took a long time to sort of unravel who he was... His family and and all that the the situation surrounding his uh, his passing was not it wasn't clean. He didn't have ID. He didn't have. It took us a while to figure this out, but I took it upon myself to to do this and figure this out and set this right because I knew someone out someone out there was was wondering about him. What about what about his body? That would have been taken care of by the city. Um, and now that you are aware of the situation, and I'll give him the number to New York City Central Corner slash morgue records office, which I would have had prepared. And you can give them a call if you would like. They can make arrangements. You can make arrangements if you want to move, if you want to move his body. but depending on where you stand with, with your religion and, and it might just be best to set set a tombstone here and, and and leave his body where it's at, but that's your business. You you have all the options that you wanna you wanna go with. Yeah, he's um in shock. You've seen people in shock before, likely several times at this point. And it's just it's crushed him. Mr. Thomas, I gotta ask you a question. Um Real important. Is it all right if I talk to your receptionist about this? Because I know that you will not remember most of what I just told you. And if I can tell her the exact same thing and have her write it down, um, I think that'll be a big, big help to you. Yeah, yeah. Let let uh, let me know everything that you you're telling me. I he sort of leans back in his office chair. Wood. The um, side handles are definitely touched with age, rubbed smooth long ago. And he leans back a little bit, and you can see him just stare off, like at the wall. And on the wall, there's a picture of him and JoJo when the kid's on his bike. He's got to be 13 or 14. And it's Christmas, and they're in some living room somewhere. And that big red bow on the bike and JoJo's just complete bliss appearance is all his father is taking in right now. Sir, I know it's it's no comfort, but 
I can tell you at least he did not. And I will lie. And I'll tell him that he did not suffer. It was fast and it was pain-free. I know that's not not helpful, but I I did want to share that and now I'm going to I'm going to get out of your way. I'm so sorry about all of this, but I'm going to go talk to your receptionist now. I'll, I'll tell her all the same. I'll give her the same information. And you take care of yourself, sir. He takes a couple of really deep breaths, sort of that flutter. <gasps> I just, I don't, I don't know. I will leave him. I'll stand up, walk towards the door, walk out and close it gently behind me. It really isn't more than a few steps that you get before you can hear him break down. You get back out to the receptionist area. And I do it again. The second time isn't necessarily any easier but it is a little less, I would say less less impactful. It's just anytime you talk about someone dying, the more you tell the story about what happened, the seemingly easier it it feels. Janine is also, you know, just aghast at it. She wants to know every bit of information, which you, of course, supply her helping to wrap a bow on this portion of the story. Also make sure she understands, in, if, unless she already knows this, but I'll, do you, Janine, you understand the nature of, of, of shock and the news I just delivered. Uh, Mr. Thomas heard this, but he did not hear any of this stuff. So that's why I'm making sure you understand that you're his conduit to this information because he's, he's going to be asking all these questions right after as soon as his brain wires itself together again. Mm. Please be be his support around what, what happened and everything. I'll give her Oscar Bennett, and I'll give her a fake New York City phone number. Well, certainly. I mean, that sort of goes without saying. You're not going to leave your real phone number and something like this. Can't be traced back. Elliot would, but Oscar doesn't. Right. Yeah, no, that's probably true. That's probably true. Elliot's a good guy. Oscar is more protective, which is likely the smarter option. So you drop a couple of just terrifying bombs on people and then walk out the door. And I will turn that rental car in and get a new one here in Highland. And then I will drive. Where are you going? Somewhere not here? So we're not here. Okay. So what we'll say is that some time passes. It's important to sort of just say some time as we'll reveal a little later how much time passes. But you had indicated that there was something else you wanted to do, which I am all for letting you do. But before that happens, we're going to make sure that we get through this portion of the home session. So you went through what's called the personal motivation portion. Um, This is going to reduce one of your bonds by one. So you're going to have to select which of the responsibilities or relationships you're going to let lapse by one. I think having dropped into this father's life and delivering this devastating news and then just disappearing, I think it's Ellie, my daughter, whose bond will suffer as I build yet another mental barrier and wall between me and her Mm -hmm. to protect me from that level of pain and protect her from no let's be honest it's just i'm thinking about me and protecting me yeah okay so roll sand for me if you would (laughs) roll 20 has seen fit to offer me a one under 42 fantastic so that That's a critical success. Interestingly enough, you are actually going to gain sanity from this movement by motivating yourself and closing the door when it came to Jojo. It is going to prove to help you. And so I am going to award Agent Winters three points of sanity. I can use it. I can use it. That will push you a little further back from the breaking point. Mm Mm-hmm which is a good thing. Okay. 
So with that portion of it done, you had indicated to me that there was more on your plate, things that you'd like to do. So we'll say that Agent Winters takes some time off and does a little traveling. You get out of the New York area. Maybe you end up in Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, maybe way further west. I don't know. I'll leave that to you to decide where it is that you choose to put up your hat at next. We'll say that some time is going to pass while that happens. I'll just say for clarity for you, the player, that if you're planning on being gone from your current job for more than, say, two weeks, a month, etc., you are going to have to come up with a plausible reason as to why you are not at work. And that might take a little bit of careful work when it comes to your bureaucracy, but Elliot's chock full of that skill. So if you need to make a reason why you can't be at work, you can certainly do that. But uh, but yeah, I'd love to hear that explanation. I do need some time away. I need a leave of absence. And I need one that's covered and not covered, but one that doesn't raise any questions over at the department. Mm-hmm. And I lost my mother, Carla, a few years ago. I wouldn't have shared that. I wouldn't have necessarily spread that around work. That's not my way at work. Right. But I will use that now as a necessary. I've got to, I've got to handle some estate stuff. I got to handle some family stuff, and I, I got to process this. Uh, at least, my secretary would have known that my mother was in a home and was was going through dementia and and, and such. Maybe even the A word. I, I need about eight weeks of leave, and so I will have tried to use that as a means and then if it was pushed back I would have said I have to there's no you know I don't know what you want me to do you can come send I guess agents after me to retrieve me because I'm, I can't be I need this time so do what you need to do yeah I don't think that I don't think there'd be pushback per se on it but it's probably pretty clear that your director would just want to make sure that you handled what you needed to handle but that the, the intention, obviously, was that you would return to work. I'll tell him over and over that I have no intention of abandoning. I mean, this is my career. This is my life. Uh, I just need this time, though, and I need, a, I need a, a, a fairly large chunk of it to make sure this is all done. And then I can come back 100% focused. Yeah, they give you leave. Standing. I think I will uh, find a nice little cozy cabin in the Appalachians. Hmm. Maybe Asheville area. So not not quite the mountains, but maybe the, the hilly foothills. Sure. Somewhere. Maybe Pigeon Forge is beautiful. Hmm. What is it, 90? It's it's 90s or early th- 2000s. I won't buy any property. I won't even think of that because, you know, I'll never need to buy property here. It's always going to be affordable and easy to rent. And Right. So be, there'll be tons of land available. Tons of land available. No one would ever come here and completely flip this place upside down. Yeah, you can easily get a hold of a a cabin in the foothills of the Appalachians for an extended period of time. So once that is all set in stone, what are you doing with that additional time then? Man, I have a couple good weeks. Just a couple restful, peaceful, good weeks. I'm sleeping. I'm, I'm cooking for myself. I'm... I'm alone with my thoughts and they are not haunting me. And then the nightmares start again. And this time, I can't stop thinking, not about the experience that we went through. I can't stop thinking about the markings, the sigils, the glyphs, the drawings, whatever it was on that goddamn board that we somehow got sucked through. And night after night, these it's just going through my head i'm trying to sleep and all i'm doing is tracing in my in my dreams these these figures and and god help me i did take some records of that we did copy down some of that stuff so at some point maybe second third week much earlier than i had hoped because i thought man this is going to be the vacation i i start digging into that okay 
digging into some of the information is really interesting. It sort of sets your mind ablaze a little bit with all of the possibilities. You tie a few things together that maybe don't go together, but seem to be pieces on the board. And I'm not talking about just the wainscoting piece that you were lugging around inside the Garretson mansion. You remember very distinctly Agent Hawking at one point told you all that there was a symbol he'd found in Abigail Wright's apartment that had been collected and put in the box. The box of evidence, which was eventually, obviously, it's, it's now gone. But it had this strange symbol on it and these strange markings that didn't remind him of really anything. And then you remember sort of the way that he explained it. And then you start seeing some of those same curves and lines on this rubbing. And you wonder if there's a correlation. And you dig and dig. And so what I'm going to have you do for me, just looking at the skill set that Agent Winters has, you have a 50 in a cult. So this is more than just a pastime, right? A 50, in my mind is a level of professional understanding. And you begin to work in that that symbol has at least something to do with demonology, which does sort of seem to fit with the experience that you had when you went through this portal, whatever it was. When you went to this other space, that thing that appeared, that thing that Hawking coupled with. It had horns. It had wings. There's something there. There's a connection. There there has to be. It's too coincidental. I also have a 70 in computer science. When I took a break from active field work, I went deep into online research and database research and stuff before something sort of shatters a little bit in my brain and a block that I had shuts off as I've been going deeper into the signs, the symbols, the demonology. And and suddenly I remember that I have seen the yellow sign. Yeah, a couple of things on that. One, and probably very importantly, that symbol, when you think about it, you think about it an awful lot. Like as it bubbles up into your conscious memory, you think about it a lot. You end up drawing it a few times. You end up looking at it at different angles. You talk out loud about it to no one in the cabin. You try to walk your way through that, finding that symbol at any of the portions of this, well, this rubbing that you made from the piece of wood. You don't see a corollary there. The symbols that are on this piece of wood, or were, they're not even in the same ballpark as this sign. It's strange. It feels like or looks like a series of arrowheads until you turn it, and then it looks like something different entirely. And over two or three days probably several bottles of whiskey and not just books, but obviously potentially a a trip to the nearby library to get on the internet. Probably a regular there at some point. Mm Mm-hmm. And spending way too much time there and putting up pictures all over every wall of that cabin. And I stopped cooking myself really good meals out on the fire and I'm eating out of cans and just leaving them half empty as I'm going deeper and deeper and deeper because my obsession has to also, this has to be an answer. I am obsessed with this idea that that building had some sort of unnatural ability to move people to an unnatural place and these things have to be connected and I'm, I'm sinking deep into it. It erases a couple of months of your life, not weeks. The first call that comes from your director goes completely to voicemail. The second call you pick up and 
somewhere in your memory, you remember having a conversation with them. You lie to him as best you can. You talk about how you're too caught up at the estate that it's the probate lawyers are all over everything and you're just going to figure out a way. Another month passes and the contact with headquarters trails off. And it really isn't until probably that eight week deadline where there's a knock on the cabin door. Do I hear it? No. No, no, not at all. I stop shaving. I stop washing. I stop cleaning. My teeth haven't been brushed. I have more important things on my mind. The light is arresting. That light from the outside. You've learned something very key, which is the light is very important or the lack thereof to see the symbol properly. You have been spending days and nights in the dark with these super, super thick blankets or curtains over any windows. You have managed in a month to dig a small crawl space underneath this cabin. And it's where you collect all these little symbols. The knock at the door, not that you'd realize it, you hear voices upstairs at one point. You're not sure who they are, but they walk around the cabin for a little bit. They say your name, you think, and then eventually they leave. You manage up the crawl space to the bottom of, well, bottom of the stairs, which you of course took out because they were in the way. You push back up through the cabin floor and that's really when it hits you. It's this symbol that's been left on the floor nearby. It's a piece of paper and it has this shield on it. You know it's a shield. You know what a shield looks like. And it reminds you of something from forever ago. That shield symbol has the words over it, Federal Bureau of Investigation. And it's like the the whole egg shatters. And you're left there, just standing in the crawl space that you've dug with your own hands, seeing all of the available papers written with this symbol that you know is the yellow sign. And you're standing there, clothes threadbare, hair down on your shoulders, beard full of dirt and beans. And you see yourself from the floor mirror across in the cabin. And it's the first time you've seen yourself in two months. So the way this is going to work is you have studied the unnatural. So I would normally ask you to choose a bond that's going to suffer for this, but I am going to tell you that Ellie will suffer for this loss of time with her father. You're going to lose four points to that bond. But I have good news as well. You're going to gain four points in the unnatural from your dedicated study. Such good news. That brings me to 14. Yep, it does. There is a search warrant or a copy of one on one of the tables in the cabin. It is looking for a missing person. That missing person is Special Agent Elliot Winters. That name is familiar. I'm happy to leave it right here. The guy that used to parade around is Special Agent Elliot Winters. We'll see what happens to him the next time we see him on camera. So uh, thank you, Nate, for joining us and playing uh, Elliot and uh, getting a little experimental with some of the things that he's doing. The next time we get in touch with Ocel, I, I think things are going to be a little bit different for everybody. So thank you and good night. <laughs>